The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, welcome, everybody. Really pleased to see you all here today um, for what will be the first of a nine lecture course uh, called Signal Processing on Databases. And this is a uh, really uh, special day for me because this sort of represents a big step in a set of technology that I've been working on for a couple of decades and, you know, really been working intensely on for the last three or four years. And um, this is the first course on what we hope will be a technology that will become very widely used. Um, it is a completely unique course on a completely unique technology. So I want to thank you for being the guinea pigs of this course. Um, it's hard enough just doing a new course on an existing topic. Uh, doing a new course on a on a novel topic is quite a challenge. So we're going to be trying a few different things here. You're going to be certain topics covered from more than one angle, and we'll see which ones sort of make the most sense for you. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the title of the course, which is a little bit different. The title is Signal Processing on Databases, which is not two phrases, signal processing and databases, that are usually connected together very often. And so uh, signal processing, as we all know, is here at Lincoln Labs, one of the most core things that we do in terms of a technology. It's almost uh, difficult to imagine a technology that's more core to what we do. The only thing I could think of was systems engineering, maybe. But signal processing is really at the heart of what we do. Mathematically, signal processing, really the heart of that is detection theory. How do you find things? Given sets of data, how do you, you know, eliminate things you're not looking for and find the things that you are looking for? And then, mathematically, the heart of detection theory is linear algebra. And so, um, just to show of hands, how many people have had a linear algebra course in there? See, that's, that's really awesome. See, at Lincoln, that's probably, this is one of the few places in the world where that was pretty unanimous. You know, there's not too many places where that's the case. And so this technology is really designed for you because it really assumes a foundation in linear algebra. And that's not as common as you might think. And so people who haven't had linear algebra, it's much harder for them to take advantage of the ideas that we're going to talk about. So signal processing, detection theory, linear algebra. That's sort of kind of the root of that first phrase. The second phrase, databases. Um, when we think of databases, we think of, of typically, you know, maybe things that you do searching on the web, text, you know, maybe uh, uh, other things like, like, like that, which is not necessarily consistent with the mathematics that we think about when we think about signal processing, detection theory, and linear algebra. We naturally go on to like real numbers, matrices, those types of things. So what we're really doing here is we're connecting that mathematics with sort of a whole new branch of data. Words and strings and relationships and so that's kind of the really novel piece of it. And it's really the core idea that we're bringing here is we're going to bring all that machinery that we know so well and we're going to try and, and apply it to this new area which is becoming increasingly important for us. So that's the explanation of the title. That's, that's how we pick the title. We could have, there's other titles. And so, um, so I just want to spend a little time on, on that. Uh, an enormous number of people have contributed to this work. This, this is a list of, of the people that I could remember at the time that I typed the slide, but no doubt I have forgotten somebody important, and so I apologize for that. But you know, certainly these people uh, and, uh, and the whole uh, team have been uh, very uh, instrumental in allowing this technology 
to move to move forward here. So this is going to be the outline for this particular lecture. And there's going to be a rhythm to most of these lectures, which is going there's going to be a lecture, which is going to be PowerPoint. I apologize. We all see plenty of PowerPoint, mainly to introduce ideas. And then there will be sort of a demo, which will go through code that is actually available in your Ello Grid accounts now. Uh, and some of that code will even be part of homework assignments, if you so choose to do the homework assignments. And so that's going to be the flavor. We'll do the slides, we'll take a short break, and then we'll do uh, the, the examples and talk about them. So let me talk about some of the kinds of, uh, and I stole this slide, uh, let me talk about some of the kinds of data that the technology that we're going to be talking about today um, uh, really, really enables. Um, it allows us to deal with data that has to deal with relationships. Uh, relationships, uh, you can, particularly as those represented by graphs. So, uh, for example, you might have vehicle tracks. Those represent relationships between locations. You know, a car goes from one place to another. That's a relationship between those locations. Um, Another is uh, social networks. You know, everyone wants to know who their friends are, how many friends they are, who their friends of friends are, those types of things. So that's another type of set of relationship. Um, again, very uh, textual and oriented, very much oriented towards words and not numbers. Uh, and another area is, uh, is cyber networks. Very uh, apropos topic that people are, you know, at least everyone is impacted by and many people are doing work on, which is, you know, relationships between computers, communication between web servers, those types of things. And again, uh, 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 that is a very important uh, area for us. Just to give you sort of a big picture here, like, well, why am I even here? Why, why do I care about this? What are the things that, that we can do? I'm going to kind of walk through an example of some of the things that we have used this technology for that have been very exciting for us. And so trying, and we'll have examples like that throughout the course, you know, uh, uh, how you can actually use this, how this has had really a real impact. And so the first one we want to talk about is, is uh, some work we've done in the cyber domain. So here's an example of a data set, which is uh, a graph that is uh, 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 web traffic. And so if we see here, this is the source IPs. So you can imagine these are the computers that are on the inside of some domain. And then these are the destination IPs, all the web servers that they hit are the green ones around here. Uh, this is sometimes referred to in graph theory as a bipartite graph. It's basically two separate sets of vertices that talk to each other but have no at least in this data set, we are not recording any connections within, within the sets. And then hopefully you can see here these faint blue lines here that are the actual connections that show you, you know, which, which of these computers are connecting to which of these computers. There's obviously a lot of data, web traffic data, there's enormous amount of it. This shows 90 minutes of data and um, you know, uh, in, in this particular case, there was actually a uh, malicious activity that, you know, we were looking to, uh, to detect in this data set. So one of the biggest challenges that you have in any data set like this is data representation. And, you know, sometimes in database parlance, this is called the schema. So how you represent your data is usually, if you can figure that out, you're almost halfway to solving the problem. And so uh, given that in this case we wanted to use graph techniques, we discovered that our data almost always doesn't come to us in a nicely formed form graph. And so we have to go through a lot of steps here. And so one thing you'll see is with this technology is that it's almost always a part of a pipeline from, from raw data to conditioning the raw data to inserting it into a database to doing analytics, 
to doing uh, queries and other types of things. You're, you're always really going to be using a pipeline and you're going to be wanting to use different technology tools for different stages in the pipeline. We're not in any way trying to suggest that the technologies we're talking about today are the only pieces. Uh, it's an important piece, the technologies we're talking about, but they're not the only pieces and you're always really functioning in the context of a pipeline. So this just shows kind of the technology stack that we will be leveraging, that we typically leverage in those types of things. Ultimately our goal is to get up here to these uh, graph analytics. Uh, one of the things we'll talking about most in these courses is the high level languages that allow you to essentially do graph analytics very easily and bridge between the databases themselves and the high performance computing that you will need. So again, not only do you have a pipeline of, of software and data, you have a pipeline or a stack of technology. So when you're addressing problems like this, usually you're starting at one place, but you will almost always, when you build a system, work out and deal with these other types of things. <laughs> All right, so that's sort of just a quick overview and example, and I don't expect any of you to be, you know, it's probably just kind of, the first example is probably to raise more questions. Well, how, how do you really do this? So now I'm going to sort of take a bit of a right turn here and really talk about what the, what the course is about, okay? And I'm going to actually talk about the course a little bit of a big picture. And I always felt that every course should, uh, should tell you why that course is the most important course you will ever take in your career. You know, I think every single course you can come up with an argument for that, but people don't say that. So I'm going to tell you why, you know, this course is the most important course you'll ever take. Of course, every course is the most important course you'll ever take, but I'm going to tell you why this one is. So stepping way back, we're all part of MIT here, and MIT has a formula for success. MIT is the number one science and engineering university on Earth. We can actually, by any reasonable measure, that is true. And uh, in fact, by the people who track this, it's, it's true by a lot, you know. And so, you know, it's a real honor to be associated with this organization, to be at an organization that's at its, at its zenith. And MIT has, has had this incredible run of success over the last 60 years because fundamentally they recognize the formula for making discoveries is a combination of theory and experiment. Bringing those two together and as an organization, we've actually organized ourselves. MIT is organized around this formula in that we have theory and experiment. And theory is the academic part of the, the mission. Um, that's, that's run out of departments. Typically, it involves mathematics. This is a place, I mean, everyone here raised their hands to linear algebra, and I can go to any part of MIT. And, be, and that, that will be true. We probably have the highest mathematical literacy of any or, instant organization on Earth. And that's a very powerful, powerful capability. The mathematics that we use, they become manifest or real typically in the forms of algorithms, and our algorithms become real in the form of software. Likewise, on the experimental side, you know, that's the research that we conduct. MIT is actually has large laboratories, laboratories that are fully peered with the departments. That is actually quite a unique thing for an academic institution to have laboratories and laboratory heads that are, you know, right up there and with the with the department heads and how they're how they're positioned. Lincoln being the largest of them, CSAIL, the Media Lab, there's there's a number of them. At, at, so we have this thing. And the focus of research of course is measurement, which is data which often gets reduced to bytes. And so often implementing this MIT formula comes down to marrying software and bytes together in a computer. That's, that's sort of where we bring these two ideas together. And so we're going to be talking a lot about that. Implementing software, bringing bytes together, analyzing them together, that's where these two things come together. And I think that's really, really important. Now, what's the tool we use? What's, what's the machine that we use to bring these together? It's a computer, all right? And nowadays, computers have gotten a little bit more complicated than the way we used to think about them. We used to think about them typically as a von Neumann machine, which means you've got data and operations, you know, bytes and software, and 
The bytes go into a part of the computer, they get operate on, they, they come out. And that model is still true at the at a high level, but but the computers we tend to deal with now are much, much, much more complicated. So on the left is a standard parallel computer. Almost every computer you use today looks like this. You have processors, you have memory, you have some kind of persistent storage, uh, you have a network connecting them together, and these form a very complicated what we call memory hierarchy. It begins with uh, uh, registers here at the top, caches, local memory, remote memory, and then storage, and these are the units that go between them. And there's a lot of implications of this, of this hierarchy in terms of what, what things are, you know, bandwidth goes up as you go this way, latency goes down, programmability generally goes up the closer you are, you don't have to worry about things, and likewise the capacity of data goes down as you go traverse this way in the hierarchy. So all modern computers you, that you use are, are these von Neumann architectures with the multi-level memory hierarchy. And fundamentally, the thing you have to know is that this, this, this architecture selects the algorithms you use. If algorithms are not going to run well in this architecture, you probably don't implement them. So one has to be very much aware of one's algorithms with respect to this architecture, because if you pick algorithms that aren't going to run well in this architecture, it's going to be very, very difficult. The goal of this course is to teach you techniques that will allow you to get your work done faster. And so this is a rather complicated drawing here, but this shows, given a problem that you want to solve, if you implement it in software, using a variety of techniques, you how, how, what the performance of those techniques is. So in a certain sense, you could view this as the volume of code that you have right to write to solve a problem. And we have implementing the program and C as a reference point. So as you move over here and you do things like in assembly or Java map produced, you end up writing more code. You move over here and do things like in C++ or Java or MATLAB, you write less code. And this shows you the relative performance. Again, as you do things in lower level environments like assembly, you can get more performance. And as you do things in higher level environments like MATLAB, you get, you get less performance. And this is a fairly general trade-off space here. If we add parallel programming models here, of which there's many. We have direct memory access. We have message passing. We have a manager worker style or map reduce style. We have a whole different styles of, of, of programming here. We're going to want to try and be here. We're going to want to do things that take less effort and deliver you more performance. And so we are going to be mostly focusing on MATLAB in this class and a technology we call D4M. I'll describe that more later. But this is a software combination that allows you to get relatively good performance at significantly reduced effort. And that's really the only thing we're doing in this course. We're just saying, if you're doing these types of problems, there's a right tool for the job, or there are right tools for the job. And if you use the right tool for the job, it will take you less time to get the job done. And we're going to try and teach you about these tools and how they actually work. Now, a little bit of bait and switch here. We call the course signal processing databases, but we're going to get to databases at the very end unfortunately, to disappoint you all. And the reason is because databases are good for one type of problem, but it's often the, at the very end of the game where you really need to work with databases. So to understand, we have a variety of different ways we can solve problems with algorithms. Okay, We can solve our problems just using a single computer's memory. We can solve our problems using a, uh, mul the, the memory on multiple computers. We can solve our problems uh, using, using disk or storage, or even with many disks. Okay? And as we go this way, we can do more and more and more data. But one of the things that really matters, and it kind of goes back to that to the other chart there, is, well, when I'm working with this data, what is the chunk size? How, what, 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 what are the blocks that I need to get the data in? And if I need to get the data in very, very small chunks, 
Well, then obviously having the data in memory is going to be the most efficient thing I can do. If I want to just get one, one record out of many records, then that's the most efficient, having the data in memory. Likewise, so, so that's where we typically start, right? If our problem is small, when we almost always try and start with our problems with small, we're going to be working here. We're going to be writing what we call serial programs on one, on one computer. And then the great thing about serial memory is that it, you know, even as our request size gets, gets, gets larger, they're, they're really not going to do anything better than just having the data in memory. So we'll be able to grow that model up to data sets that aren't, that are, that are fairly small, maybe gigabytes. And, uh, and we can continue to use that model just fine. And then if we decide, well, we're really moving beyond that, we need to do more data, uh, uh, we, can, we can go to a parallel program to get, to get more memory, or we can use data in files. We can write our data to files, we can read them in, process them, and read them out. And that model works very, very well. And in fact, particularly if we're going to be accessing the data in large chunks, if I have a lot of data and look, I want to do some processing on the whole, whole, bit, whole piece of it. Likewise, if we go to very large data sets, we find that we can even do parallel programs writing files in parallel if we want to do extremely large problems, that we want to traverse all the data. But finally, we're going to come back to this case where we need a database. And a database is when we have very large amounts of data, but we want to access you know, database, data that won't fit in our memory, but we want to access in little bits. We want to look up something. And that's really the only time we really need a database. Unless, of course, someone says, this is your data. It is available to you on a database. That's the only way you're going to access it. So, But if you have control, you, so you always want to follow this path. You want to start with your serial program in memory. Maybe go to a parallel program using files. Maybe parallel files. And then the, la the database is almost the tool of last resort because it adds a great deal of complexity and while it can look up things much quicker, if you actually end up doing something where you're going to be traversing a significant fraction of the data, you will find it's actually significantly slower than if you had the data on files. So we're going to show you techniques. We're going to follow this path. And then hopefully by the end, you'll be like, oh, well, yes, now I know I would use a database for these instances. But I realize that I can get most of my work done using these other techniques that work just fine. So hopefully, you're going to be learning what we call the fast path. So if you want to get a certain level of performance, OK, if you have no training or minimal training, this is the path that you follow. You, you begin using a technology. Your program gets slower for a while. You beat your head against the wall and the web for a while. Maybe eventually after days you get back to where you were and then slowly you climb up here to get it to some level of performance weeks later. This is something that we observe time and time again and typically what happens is that right around here people just give up with the technology and they say the technology didn't work for them. So we're, the point of this class is to give you the techniques that an expert would have an expert could use the technology, know exactly how to use it, and then can go on this path where basically within hours they're getting good performance and if they really want to take it to the next level, they can spend days doing that. And so that's kind of our whole philosophy here. So we're going to actually have some new concepts in this course. I think they're talked about in the, um, in the, um, in the course outline a little bit. Uh, some of the really new ideas that you probably wouldn't have run across in in other courses. So we're going to be talking about graphs a lot in this course. Um, the standard graph that, uh, how many people have taken a, a graph theory course or a computer science course that talked about graphs? See, Most, most. I'm glad to see linear algebra is still the stronger one here. Uh, that's more important. We don't between the two, having the linear algebra background is the more important. But, and I can, if you know linear algebra, I can teach you graph theory pretty easily. 
Um, the traditional definitions of graphs, though, that are taught in most computer science courses, they tend to focus on um, what we call uh, undirected, unweighted graphs. So these are, a graph is a set of vertices and edges, and so what we're saying when we say it's an undirected, unweighted graph is that all the edges are the same between any two vertices. There's no real difference between them. Either an edge exists or it doesn't. It's kind of like a zero or a one. And then it doesn't really, when we say, you know, two vertices connected, there's no directionality of that. And so that's the, the, the majority of graph theory and what's taught in class sort of base, is based on that. Excuse me. Unfortunately, when we get into the real world, Unfortunately, when we get into the real world, we find that I've never run into that kind of graph in the real world. In the years I've been doing this, I've never actually, you know, run into that kind of graph. In fact, another part of that is they'll talk about the distribution. In fact, you'll often hear something called an erdish renyi graph, which is just a random connection. That is, any two vertices are randomly connected with maybe some probability, you know. And... Uh, and again, I've never run into that either in the real world. So the focus of graph theory that we have, now that we have all this data and can compare the theory and the data, compare the theory of the experiment, we see that the theory is, is wanting. The theory is not a good stepping stone into the, into the data. And so what we see is that the real data is uh, it's not random. It's often what we call a power law distribution that is certain vertices are very popular and many most vertices are don't have a lot of connections to them usually the edges are directed that is there's meaning you know if, if i send uh, if i if i friend you it's not the same as you friending me on facebook or twitter or you twit face or whatever the whatever the technology is of the future um um, usually the edge itself has meaning, has weight. That weight could be a value, it could be words, it could be other types of things. Uh, the, uh, the, you can have, typically you have multiple edges. I could send you many friend requests. You know, that's not the same thing as me sending you one friend request. Maybe I can't send you friend requests. I have multiple and one friend, friend requests, I don't know. But, but, but you can have multiple edges between vertices. And probably most importantly is edges are often what we call hyper. And this is very important concept that is not, that is almost never touched on in graph theory, which is that an edge can connect multiple vertices at the same time. A classic example would be an email that you send to multiple people. In fact, most emails these days have more than one recipient. And so there is a, me sending an email to everyone in the class, one email to everyone in the class, is a hyper edge. That edge, the email, connects and it has direction you know, me with all the recipients. That's very different than me individually sending an email to every single one of you, which would be a standard edge. So this is a, an important concept, not typically discussed a lot in standard graph theory that's very important. So we're going to move beyond the sort of standard definition of graphs in this class, and that's going to be hard. Um, we're going to deal with a bigger definition of linear algebra. Traditionally, linear algebra is dealing with matrices that have indices for the rows and the columns, and the values are, are real numbers, maybe integers, maybe complex numbers. We, we deal with complex numbers here a lot. But we're going to be dealing with things like strings. We're going to be taking linear algebra and applying it to things like words. And so that's going to be different. In fact, it's actually one of my favorite. Maybe it might be the part of the course that puts you all to sleep, but it's actually one of my favorite parts of the course. And then bigger definition of processing. Um, one of the dominant things you'll hear about in this space, there's a lot of technologies out there. Uh, popular technology is called Hadoop, and it's MapReduce Parallel Programming Paradigm, which is uh, a great technology to kind of get people started. Um, but, but for people with the mathematical sophistication that we have, we can use programming models that are, that are simply better. If you understand mathematics to the level that we do, we can give you tools for programming parallel computers that are just more efficient in terms of you write less code and you get better performance than using 
techniques that really are designed for people that don't have the mathematical, the linear algebraic background that you have. So this is really going to be the foundation of the course. So let me continue here with the course outline. So this is going to be essentially the nine lectures of the course. I think this is still pretty accurate. So we're in the introductory course here. We're going to review the course and goals. The next course is really going to be dealing with this concept of associative arrays, which is the core technology that sort of brings all this together. When I talk about extending linear algebra to words using funny, uh, using, sorry, funny, using fuzzy algebra, that really gets into a mathematical abstract algebra concepts called group theory. Uh, it, it's not nearly as scary as it may sound. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll get into that. It's actually, I think, quite elegant and really good to know. Uh, good to know that when you work with the technology and you work with associative arrays, that we've actually thought about the mathematics of how these things work together. And when we add a feature, it's usually because it fits mathematically. And when we don't add a feature, it's usually because someone has made a request and like, yeah, that's really going to take people into a bad place. Um, then we're going to get into really sort of uh, the sort of the center part of the class where we're going to show you how we do analysis of any's on unstructured data and then doing analysis on structured data. We're going to, I've talked about power laws. We're going to have a whole class on power law data modeling of that. Uh, deal with them. We have another class on cross correlation. And then we're really going to get into parallel processing and databases. And the last two classes aren't even going to merely be lectures. They're going to be really just the demos. And really, because that's where we're going to be really bringing a lot of things together. And we're going to walk you through code examples. But we're going to need to take some time to really walk you through them. Because you're going to see, wow, there's all these ideas that we've talked about coming together in these code examples. So there is, we have lectures, if you see in the software, that's available in your LO Grid accounts. All the lectures are there already, and um, I think we have lectures one through seven. So seven is the eighth lecture, or I'm sorry, zero through seven. So seven is the eighth lecture, and then um, and that that will be kind of a short lecture, and then nine, you know, the, the ninth lecture will be just going through examples. So we believe in this whole philosophy philosophy of of of, of taking a linear algebraic point of view from with graphs so much that we even wrote a book about it. So, and you've all been given copies of this book. This really um, gives you kind of the, the, the philosophy and the power of if you think about graphs using the techniques, I highly encourage you to, to flip through it. Um, there's certain parts of this, certain sections here that are really almost taken directly out of this book. And, uh, but a lot of it is supplementary material. And what you'll discover is that this course is really the bridge to these techniques. This course allows you to go from kind of this mess of unstructured words and other types of things and then put them into this nice linear algebraic format so that now you can do, you know, these, these techniques that are described in the book. So, so this is almost a bridge to that, and, I, you know, I certainly encourage you to, to, to look at that and to ask me questions about it at any time. So now I'm going to come back to our original example, which was this cyber thing, and kind of walk through that a little bit more detail and maybe highlight a few of the things that I've talked about already. So here's a very standard data processing pipeline. So what we want to do is we have raw data, in this case our raw cyber data, which is a series of records, and we need to convert that into a set of vertices and edge lists from which we can then do get graphs and graphs analysis. And as you'll see, uh, typically what you do is you write parsers that convert this data from some raw format to some format that is sort of the next step in your processing chain. And then we convert these edge lists into adjacency matrices, which is how we, we, uh, we uh, uh, view our graphs. Uh, one word on adjacency matrix. Let me go back here. This is a graph, <laughs> for those of you who don't know. It's a set of vertices and edges. Okay, and this is an adjacency matrix of that graph. Basically, every single row is a vertex, every single column is a vertex, and if an edge exists, we put a dot here. 
There's a formal duality between graph theory. The fundamental operation of graph theory is what's called breadth first search, which is shown here, giving a starting vertex, you know, traverse its edges to its neighbors. And we have the same thing going on here. Given a starting vertex in a, in a vector, we do a matrix multiply to identify the neighbors. And so at the deepest, most fundamental level, graph theory and linear algebra are linked because the fundamental operation of graph theory is breadth first search, and the fundamental operation of linear algebra is vector matrix multiply. So we are wish to form these adjacency matrices so we can take advantage of that. Here's a little bit more detail how we're going to use this technology D4M to do that. So you have a raw data. We convert the raw data into CSV files, stands for comma separated value files. It's kind of the default format of spreadsheets and tables. It's become very popular over the years. I remember when it first came out 20 or 30 years ago, it wasn't that popular. You know, it's like people did, but now it's become extraordinarily po popular. Uh, file format, it really is ideally suited for this kind of data. So we convert that into CSV files. We then take those CSV files, read them in using our D4M technology to insert them into a distributed database. We can then query that distributed database to get these associative arrays. And then we can, from the associative arrays now, we have the full power to do our graph algorithms. So D4M really helps you in going you know, these few steps and setting the table so that you can then do graph algorithms. And you can even then do the graph algorithms without even using D4M at all. You can just use regular linear algebraic operations in MATLAB just fine. But this is that bridge, that connector. In fact, I highly recommend people do that. I highly recommend you use D4M for the only the parts of your problem that, that it is good for and use other technologies, you know, like MATLAB ordinary matrices and other types of things. It's good for you. You'll get better performance. It's good for me because... If you have problems, you'll bother somebody else and not us. So that's good. It's good for everybody. So an example of kind of what this looks like. Here's a proxy log that we got from, from the data. It shows a, a web, uh, you know, essentially a web, a web log. And the first thing we do is essentially convert this into a CSV file. So basically each essentially entry here gets a column. We have an ID for the, for the actual entry. In this case, it's a source IP, a server IP, a timestamp, and then the actual line of text that's associated with, with it. And this can go on and on and on. We can have many different types here. And, uh, and if you were um, doing standard database person, you put your SQL hat, which is sort of the standard database on, you would just take that data and you would make a table that would have these columns and you would insert them and away you would go. Okay. But what we discover is that the challenge becomes when you want to look up data quickly or you want to insert data. Let's say you have an enormous volume of data that you want to insert and you want to be able to look up any, say, IP address or any timestamp or something like that. What you discover is that you know, SQL might give you good performance, but there are databases out there and technologies that will give you better performance. And these databases are called triple stores because they store all the data as anyone? anyone? Triples. Yes, they store all the data as triples. So, which means we'll have a row and a column and a value associated with everything. So what we do is we take our dense data and we do what we call create an exploded table. So essentially we have the log ID, we append that and we take the, the column name and we append its value to it and the server IP. And this is what we call an exploded table. Now, if you're an old SQL person like me, this, this schema will immediately give you hives and other type of allergic reactions and you'll want to go to the hospital because you're creating an enormous number of columns. And, 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 and in SQL, you can dynamically uh, create columns, but at your peril. At your, basically, you can create columns dynamically, but the database reserves the right to recopy the entire table and reformat the entire table if it so requires. 
Well, triple stores don't have this requirement. Triple stores only store the non, non-blank entries, and so they're perfectly happy with as many columns as you want. If you have a billion rows, 10 billion columns, completely fine with that. So that's a powerful thing. So I think we talked about that. So we use the indices as rows, and we create unique type value pairs for every single column. Now, by itself, this schema does you absolutely no good. You basically just made your life harder because by itself, all most database tables, uh, database systems, including triple stores, are going to have an orientation. They're going to be row oriented or column oriented, and in this case, the databases we will be talking about are almost always row oriented, which means they can get a row in constant time. Give it a row key like this, and then you can look it up very quickly, and it will give it back to you very quickly. That's what they're designed to do, and you can insert enormous volumes of data and they will, they, will, they will preserve that contract. You can be inserting millions of entries per second and you can still look up stuff in, in milliseconds. So very powerful technology. But all we've done so far is made it so that the format of, uh, of my data is in this funny format coming out the other side. I've just made myself harder, my, my life harder. Well, we, there is a payoff, which is we also store the transpose of the table. So, to anybody who's used to sparse linear algebra, this is an old and ancient technique. We almost always store A and A transpose because in sparse linear algebra, we'll either have a, a row-oriented or column-based store, and, and then we just want to keep one around because certain operations are going to be faster with the transpose, and certain operations are going to be faster with the matrix. We do the exact same thing here. And combined with our exploded schema, now every single one of those columns is a row. And now we have indexed every single string in the entire database once with one simple schema of two tables. And not to say that, you know, all your databases will only have two tables, but they might be three tables or four tables is typically what we see, which is a huge reduction compared to the standard database schemas that one uses, where it's easy to have dozens and dozens of tables, even hundreds of tables, in a sort of well-thought-out schema. Here, essentially, it's one schema to rule them all, one table and its pair, and you've indexed every single thing. And the cost is you've doubled your storage, and every single database person that you talk to, if I said in exchange for doubling your storage, I will give you fast index access to every single string in your database, they'll usually take that deal a hundred times out of a hundred. So that's the power here of this technology is you can uh, reference enormous uh, data sets and we'll come back to this schema over and over again but that's sort of the madness. We'll be, as we move forward with associate arrays, we always view things in this way and I want you to know at the end there's a really good reason why we do that. So now we've ingested our data into the database and we can do queries. So if I have a binding to a table and one of the things in the deform technology that we do that's very nice for you is if you're using a table and it's transposed, we hide that for you completely. If you do an insert into the table, it will automatically insert as transpose. And if you do a lookup on rows, it will know to use one table. And if it does a lookup on columns, it will know to use the other table. So here we're doing essentially a, a range query. This just says, give me all the data from this range, you know, timestamp, May, whatever, to, this just looks like about a three hour time window. So that's a query into the database and it returns an associated array of keys. And here's what that looks like. It looks like a bunch of triples. I'm gonna then take the, the rows of those keys. So basically I found every single row within a particular timestamp. I now wanna get the whole row so I can get the row of that and pass that back in the table to get the actual data. Now you see I get the whole row, so I get the server IP and all that stuff, the complete list. Now, I'm gonna do a little algebra here. I wanna create the, the graph. 
it's all source IPs and server IPs. So I get to do this with this basically correlation here, which is essentially a matrix matrix multiply. That's it. I've just constructed the entire source IP and server IP graph from all the data in this time window. That is the power of D4M, is it allows you to do correlations on this kind of data the same way we do correlations in tr using traditional techniques in linear algebra. And you can be like, well, wow, well, this, you're, you know, I, just, this is motivational at this point. We'll get into exactly how you do this and exactly how, you, uh, uh, how this works in the example. But this is really what people use D4M for, is to get to this point where they can do these types of manipulations. And the key to detection theory is doing correlations. Correlations allow us to determine what the backgrounds of our data are, what the, what the clutter of our data are, and then we can, we're on our way with traditional detection theory and signal processing techniques and all the things that we know we love. So this is kind of that, that connection made manifest. And so here you can see we now have an associative array or an adjacency matrix that's a, you know, eventually a bunch of source IPs and their server IPs. And we can actually plot that and that's how we got I get the adjacency matrix of this graph, G, this is what it is. That's how we construct it. This is the code we actually use to construct that graph. All right, so moving on here. So this just shows the kind of the whole thing here. We had a whole week's worth of proxy data. This just shows you the timing that it took about two hours to ingest it and about three hours to do this processing. Uh, you know, 100 million proxy logs, 44.5 billion triples. This is big data. You know, this is really, this is big data. This is the kind of thing that you can do. Um, you know, whatever anybody else is doing, you should be able to do it on larger scales than other people using this technology. So that brings us to the end of the lecture. So just to summarize, you know, big data of this type is found in a wide range of areas, you know, document analysis, computer networks, DNA sequencing. There's a kind of a gap between the tools that people traditionally use to, to do this problem, and D4M, this technology, uh, fills this gap. So with that, are there any questions before we get on to the examples slide? Yes. Yes. So the data, so, so we, oh yes, the question was, does it generalize to multi-dimensions, I guess. And so um, there may be kind of two questions there. So um, if you had, if I just correlated all the data, took, the, took that table out, and just fully correlated with, those, I would end up with a giant matrix of blocks, each one representing different correlations. So the source IP server IP correlation, the source IP source IP correlation, which would be empty because it's a bipartite graph, and then all the other correlations would form different blocks in that type of thing. So in that sense, we support multi-dimensions. Whether we support, but supporting multi-dimensions in terms of tensors, okay, well, generally in sparse linear algebra, there's very minimal support for higher dimensions. Uh, I'll put a little shout out to my friend Tammy Kolda, who has a technology called the uh, Sparse Tensor Toolbox. She's a scientist at uh, Sandia, and so I encourage you to, to do that. But all of our stuff is in two dimensions from a linear algebraic perspective. Also, linear algebraically, the math there is a little bit more common then when you get into the tensor and then you have these kind of weird products that you're starting, which you can define, but are just not commonly taught. So, uh, and you might be like, well, you're really losing something there. I'd really like to have multiple, multiple dimensions. Well, when we've looked at it, the fact of the matter is the sparsity always increases as you go to higher dimensions. And the sparsity is sparse enough. So typically the kinds of data that we will have, if you have N vertices, you'll have maybe 10 times n edges. So the sparsity is, you know, is extremely low. We added a dimension, the sort of internal data structure cost associated with adding that dimension would not 
reap the benefits because now your sparsity is even lower. And so that's generally not something that is as commonly used. But if you're interested in exploring that, I certainly encourage people to download that toolbox, very well written software, and people can, can people uh, uh, explore that. Other questions? That was an outstanding question. Any other questions at this time? Very good. All right. Well, why don't we stop the recording right now, and then we will switch. Take a, why don't we take like a five-minute break? I think there's some water out there and stuff for people. And then we'll get back to um, the, the examples, which probably will be a lot more fun. So hopefully wake you up after, after this, uh, this, these view graphs. <laughs>